Today on the Everything 80s podcast, we're looking at how the A&W third pounder failed because of math. Hey there, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s podcast. I'm Jamie. Thanks for coming on out today. And quick question, which is bigger, a quarter pound or a third pound? Got your answer? If that seems like an obvious answer, it wasn't to the general public in the 80s, and this proved disastrous for the A&W company. So this is what we're looking at today, the A&W Third Pounder. This was a burger released in the 80s that was meant to compete with McDonald's Quarter Pounder, but the public's inability to understand fractions led to its untimely failure. This is a very real story, and it's a actually very interesting story, and a cultural story, and a marketing story, all rolled into one. But before we start that, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you find your podcasts. I should be there. Okay, here we go. So I'll admit that math is not my strong suit, but even as a stupid idiot kid, I did know the difference between fractions. Apparently, this wasn't the case for A&W, and the public's lack of ability to understand fractions led to the demise of what was going to be one of their flagship products. So I love A&W. I think it's one of the best choices if you're going for fast food. McDonald's, to me, is honestly one of the last choices I would make. And these days, there's so many good fast food options out there. And the thing is, though, there is no touching McDonald's as a worldwide fast food powerhouse. Along with the Big Mac, the Quarter Pounder may be the most famous and popular fast food item ever. I did a whole show on the history of Chicken McNuggets, which is surprisingly interesting if you want to go back and listen to that one. But of course, they dominate the world when it comes to burgers and fast food, especially in the 80s. So since they're absolutely the juggernaut of the burger industry... Um, and the quarter pounder is dominating sales, it would make sense to try and compete with that. And that's what A&W did. They took their own attempt at making their version of the quarter pounder. And this is what leads to the monumental failure that they could never, ever have expected. So actually, it's important to look at the success of the quarter pounder. And The first thing is to keep in mind here that a quarter pounder is the weight of the hamburger patty before it is cooked. It obviously reduces in size, so you're never really getting what you were paying for to start with. The quarter pounder goes all the way back to 1971, and like many other McDonald's staple items, was thought up by a franchise owner. Same thing with the Happy Meal, same thing with Chicken McNuggets. A lot of the top creations of McDonald's were not through a corporate boardroom, but by people just own these franchises and saw what was happening in the public. So it's a guy named Al Bernadine, and he had once worked in product development for McDonald's, but then went on to own a few locations of his own. He was constantly looking to improve on the menu and wondering what other options they could offer that the customers would want, or more to the point, what items do they not even know that they want that they could offer. One issue he saw was that their burgers didn't have a very good meat to bun ratio as a McDonald's hamburger patty is actually pretty thin. Bernadine thought adults would want some more meat on their bun and came up with the quarter pounder that he would first launch at his location in Fremont, California. The quarter pounder was a big hit in Fremont, and it would then be rolled out worldwide in 1973. The quarter pounder would become one of the most popular fast food items ever, to the point McDonald's was able to trademark the name quarter pounder. So then I reference, of course, their dominance in the 80s, and I think it's worth looking at. Um, how important this was. And it may have been the very best decade in the history of the McDonald's franchise. Of course, if you grew up during this time period, you remember, like I mentioned, there wasn't really a ton of fast food options, uh, especially compared to today. McDonald's has dominated the landscape. We didn't have Shake Shack, Chipotle, Chick-fil-A, Five Guys, Popeyes, or any of the other big companies that now dot the fast food landscape. and, And also with healthier fast food options and everything. When I think of fast food growing up, I really only think of McDonald's, Burger King, KFC, and Pizza Hut. Maybe maybe Wendy's. It wasn't as big where I lived. Everything, though, was pretty much burger-based, and of course, McDonald's ruled them all. 
here's how good the 80s were uh, to McDonald's. So the there's information I checked. Now, if you want to look at this whole subject, I've got the blog post, which is the show notes for this whole thing. And it's got uh, links to some of the information. It's got some clips of commercials and um, videos from YouTube during this time period and everything. So you can go to everything80spodcast.com slash awthirdpounder or wherever you're listening, there should be a link to take you right there. But just if you want to see some of this stuff. But this information showed that sales had nearly tripled to $17.3 billion in 1989 from $5.4 billion in 1979. Their growth, w- growth rate was an astonishing 12%, and sales at individual restaurants had gone from $1 million in 1979 to $1.62 million in 1989. McDonald's served their 75th billionth burger in 1989 compared to the 30 billion served at the beginning of the decade. And the big thing was the rapid growth of new restaurants. McDonald's added 5,415 new restaurants through the 80s, which works out to a new location every 16 hours. That's insane. So we obviously know what a massive company this is, but their success in the 80s is astounding. And no other food company, not even a lot of other companies have ever seen growth like this. So of course, A&W wanted a piece of this action. And here's a quick history on A&W. Probably better known for their root beer, depending where you're from, A&W has still been a player in the fast food game for a while. The whole concept goes way back to 1919, when Roy W. Allen first set up roadside stands that were selling this new beverage called root beer. The A&W name comes from the last names of Allen and then his, his then partner, Frank Wright, who joined with him to open the first restaurant in 1923. The restaurant caught on pretty quickly, and by 1926, they started to franchise. A&W really may have been the originator of the fast food franchising business. The idea with the franchises was to sell the root beer in as many markets as possible, but the franchise owner could decide what food he would sell. The company really progressed into the 50s and 60s and started spreading around the world, specifically here in my home country, Canada, where they are still a very major player today. An amazing fact is that for a short time in the 70s, A&W had more restaurants than McDonald's. A&W always lent itself to that throwback 50s style drive-in malt shop sort of nostalgia feel. They offered a wider range of food options too, and they always had their signature frosty mugs to serve their root beer in. You could also get their burger variations, including Mama Burgers, Papa Burgers, and the Grandpa Burger, which I think is like eight patties on it. Today, especially here in Canada, A&W has really led the way in offering the cleanest sources possible for their beef. They are very big on antibiotic-free meat trying to keep things as local within the country as possible. They are also one of the first fast food chains to offer plant-based options like the Beyond Burger. But due to some inconsistencies in operation and lawsuits in the 70s, their growth really halted while McDonald's started to surge ahead. This forced A&W to try and match what was working for McDonald's. The first thing was to introduce their own Ronald McDonald mascot alternative in 1974 named Root Bear. The other is to try and compete head-on with the success of the Quarter Pounder by offering a better alternative, the Third Pounder. So let's look at the development of this third pounder. The story of this whole thing is just classic marketing, and it's a good idea that's results just could have never been predicted or foreseen. The idea behind the third pounder was as simple as can be. To compete against a quarter pounder, just add more beef. This isn't a where's the beef Wendy situation. I have a whole, that's a really interesting story too, that I've done a whole podcast on, the where's the beef campaign. Um, with Clara Peller and the Super Bowl. all It's really good if you want to go back and listen to it. So they wanted to offer as much beef as possible while still keeping the cost around the same. Everyone knew McDonald's was sort of skimping on the beef, and not only did they want to call them out for it, they wanted to give the better alternative. So it seems pretty simple, and they would also make it a point to cost around, if not less, than the quarter pounder. So like the third pounder would be a no-brainer decision. They just didn't realize that the concept of no brain would come back to haunt them. The focus would be kept on using fresh beef, as consumers seem to prefer this much more than the frozen hockey pucks being served by other fast food chains. 
A&W would aggressively market this larger and fresher burger while also promoting the fact that it was being chosen in blind taste tests and it didn't even cost more. So with all this information, A&W launched a very lavish and very expensive marketing campaign that targeted TV and radio. Radio ads were still a thing in the 80s, but they weren't selling. And again, go to the show notes, um, the link in the description if you want to see those original Third Pounder commercials. This is a burger and a story a lot of people don't know about. If you never were around at that time or just... Did miss the commercials or were not an A&W person, it, it was very easy to have it pass you by. But like I said, they put a lot into this thing. But the fact is they just weren't selling, but it just didn't make sense. It's cheaper and you get more. So A&W at this time is now owned by a man named Alfred Tabam, and he wanted to get to the bottom of this. This meant bringing in renowned market research firm, um, these are hard to hear there. They're Yankovic, Skelly, and White. And they were the ones who were trying to figure out what the hell was happening. So this is where it all seems ridiculous. But simply put, the A&W third pounder failed because the average person did not understand fractions. The general consensus was that the public thought that a quarter pounder sounded like it was more than a third pounder because the number four is larger than the number three. This might seem pretty astounding to hear now. Uh, just this, something like this can be possible. It just sounds like a, a joke. But you know, if we're thinking that way, can you imagine the response from the heads of A and W at the time? They had a better product. Again, this remember this is fresh beef. There's more of it, and it's cheaper. the 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 price point alone even if they were equal, should have been enough to bring people over because it wasn't a frozen burger. But it didn't happen. How in the world could this not work? And it's all because four is bigger than three. There's nothing in the world you can do to pre prepare for a scenario like this. And um, Alfred uh, Taubom came to realize this. He wrote a book called Threshold Resistance. And it's all about his life and I've actually read it. It's pretty good. It's all about his life and marketing and fast food and, and, and subjects like this. And in this book, he looked back on this whole situation and said, they did all the market research and testing needed, but the issue came down to price and the perceived sense of value. And this is right from the book. So he states, more than half the participants of the Yankovich focus groups questioned the price of our burger. Why, they asked, should we pay the same amount for a third pound of meat as we do for a quarter pound of meat at McDonald's? You're overcharging us, unquote. So you have to just sort of read this guy's words that he, he's still looking back and in, in like utter disbelief that this happened, that he, did go, he had to go through this process. And that baffling admission that the participants were saying basically just left them shaking their heads. There, there wasn't a response to that sort of thing. Usually, you know, with market research, you're, you're trying to adjust and adapt, but there's no adapt in this scenario. Um, Taubon, the owner, was beside himself. He's, quote, in the book, quote, honestly, people thought a third of a pound was less, less than a quarter of a pound. After all, three is less than four, unquote. There are a lot of great examples of the stupidity of humans, but I don't know if they get much better than this one. And I know what you're thinking. This must have been limited to a bad combination of dullards in the focus group. They just went into the wrong place at the wrong time, um, just the wrong combination. But it wasn't. This same mindset was happening all over the country as this was being noted by the extremely poor sales. Like I mentioned... For that period in the 70s, you know, there were more A&W restaurants than there were McDonald's. So, uh, you know, McDonald's is growing massively in the 80s, but it's not like all those A&W restaurants went away. And then a lot of times they were in the same location and they spent all this money on this very aggressive marketing campaign. They're all over TV. They're all over the radio. So it was hard to ignore it. When you think back to the 80s, when there was pretty much only three TV networks, there was a good chance people were going to see your ad, especially if you could get them on into prime time. I, I, think, I forget what the term is. I think they called it block marketing, where they would set out to be airing at the same time, say at like 
625 or like the second commercial break during a TV show, but on all networks. So whoever's watching TV, it doesn't matter what network they on, they're on, they're going to see your advertisement. And again, this is a time where a lot of people were listening to the radio. R- radio is still a thing. And it's actually surprisingly more effective than you'd realize today. But in the 80s, this was a big thing. This was playing in stores and cars and everywhere. And uh, they made sure they were, you know, following news uh, breaks at the top of the hour. And, you know, they did all their research to find the best time when the most ears were on it. So it was actually hard to ignore this thing. And despite all this, the sales were poor around the country because of this continual observation by people that thought a quarter of a pound was more than a third of a pound. So the A&W had, or sorry, the A&W third pounder had to be discontinued because now they're just, they have too much inventory and product that's not being sold. And and remember they're using fresh beef. So it was leading to a ton of wastage and it's actually like now losing the money. So they couldn't really adapt everything. And what we get out of all this is a very interesting 1980s marking lesson uh, that a lot of businesses learned from the failure of the A&W third pounder. And I'm not sure if you're into marketing, marketing, I find it very interesting just in how we are, um, why we desire the things we do, why some ads work on us and some don't. And people, you know, some people will say, you know, advertising doesn't work on me, but it does. And when it does work, you don't realize it's working. So in all of our heads, we have like a virtual shopping mall in our head or or like a virtual supermarket. And on all those shelves are the products we go to, the the products we choose without thinking about it. But why did we ever desire those things? Uh, Because at some point, a marking message got across why we should have this thing. And that's why you go for certain drinks or certain brand of shoes or whatever. They just become accustomed and ingrained in your mind. And this is interesting from the marketing aspect because they had to learn and future companies would learn from this, that as much as you might be prepared for all obstacles, you really can't foresee everything. And there's probably no better example than this. Another important lesson is how clear you need to be with your message and marketing. You can't assume that the information you are relaying is resonating properly with the audience. Um, again, it just, it seems like something you would never even have to consider that you would have to, in your marketing and in your commercials, explain to the general public that this burger that is a third of a pound is going to get you more than this quarter pound. I mean, every second is valuable in the commercial time and they're trying to explain why this is better and it tastes better and it's flame grilled and it's fresh meat. And, you know, there, there's only so much time and they don't want to waste it especially having to explain about fractions. Turns out they probably should have. Other companies, especially fast food ones, learned how clear communication is imperative. Um, The right wording, the right terms, everything has to be like crystal clear. There can't be anything left to chance. Companies learn from this and they learn they had to put their ego to the side, drop the judgment and learn how to market and advertise in the clearest, most concise way possible. And, you know, like I'm laughing at this here now and I'm sure we all are. And it's, it's easy to snicker at the average person not being able to do a fraction. But if the language or terms you use can even have a hint of confusion, you need to nip it in the bud or it could cost you millions. And A&W was unfortunately the um, guinea pig for all this. And now when you see advertisements or terms or warnings on things that just seem so stupid, like, you know, don't drink this cleaning product or whatever. They have to have everything absolutely laser clear because they can't leave anything to chance because it could cost them millions if everything is not perfectly defined. And the A&W third pounder is partly responsible for why we see some of this asinine and moronic like wording in terms of conditions and descriptions of products because they saw how damaging this could be this could be to a company 
A company may be mad that their customers and users simply don't get it, but this kind of thinking, which plagued a and will not hold up against the bottom line. You can be mad at it all you want. It doesn't matter if you're losing millions. No matter the industry, the a and third pounder, um, the failure of the third pounder show businesses that communication needs to be quick, easy, and get the point across. Just speaking of failures like this, I'll have a few shows coming up in a little while that were kind of happening at the same time that are, are related to, you know, the wording and the terminology and what, you know, just expectations of customers that they couldn't foresee. And one has to do with the Hoover Vacuum Company and a free flight promotion that completely backfired. And the same thing with uh, the story of the American Airlines Air Pass, which was like this lifetime free flight thing that they thought seemed straightforward. And it basically led to easy public confusion, which ended up almost bankrupting uh, Hoover in the one case and like practically decimating American Airlines and all their marketing. So again, this happening at the same time, sort of in, in different realms and different aspects, but um, look out for those ones. Cause again, amazing things of just giving maybe the public a little too much credit <laughs> when not, when it shouldn't be there. So I'll start winding it down here. The a third pounder might not have been directly responsible for the dwindling success of the a company, but it sure didn't help, as fewer than 500 locations existed by the mid-80s. A freeze was put on opening new locations, and the company would go into a new direction heading into the late 80s. a obviously made it through this mess as they continue to, um, you know, relatively thrive today in a very competitive fast food market. But the debacle of the third pounder did not help matters at a time when the company was already starting to flounder. There's never a good time for a failure like this. This was the worst possible time that this thing could have gone down. The NW third third pounder story is an amazing bit of marketing history and 80s lore and the fact you can never take the customer's intelligence or lack of it for granted. I'm not sure if it was a slight dig, but years later, McDonald's would offer their own third pounder option, but made sure to not include that in the description. Nowhere in any of the marketing was the word third pound mentioned, and instead, they went with the title you probably know best, the Angus Burger. Yep, it comes from the a third pounder. So I'll finish it there. Hope you like this episode. Um, I don't know. I find this stuff interesting. The... Um, sort of the trials of 80s marketing as they're navigating through this landscape and finding all this new growth that companies have never experienced before. But uh, if you like this episode, make sure you subscribe wherever you find your podcast. That way you automatically get them. If you really like it, give the show a rating and review. That gets it in front of more people. But I appreciate you taking the time to listen to this show. And if you want to find a way to support this show and get some free audio goodies in the meantime, you'll want to check out what I'm doing at patreon.com and this is a platform which is a way to you know donate and help support independent shows like this because as great as podcasts are the i guess you could call it an industry now is just like exploded and it's now filled with these giant companies and huge podcast networks so it makes it tougher for like independent shows like this um, you know, it's a stand out and that's what patreon.com is. So it's, you know, for as little as like a few bucks a month, it helps to support me and the show, but then there's different tier levels and at yeah, different tiers, you get different bonuses. So like at the Boba Fett level, you get access to the everything eighties movie club, where I do movie reviews of the good and the bad and the ugly of 1980s movies just for patrons. And then there's other tiers with different rewards, like getting shout outs on the show and being able to suggest episodes. And if you want to learn more, just go to patreon.com slash eighties. So P A T R E O N.com slash eight zero S or again, wherever you're listening on whatever podcast platform or listener, there should be a link there just if you want to check out more, but I appreciate you taking the time to listen to this show. And like I said, there's millions of podcasts out there. So the fact you're here listening to this one means a lot, but I will be back soon with a new episode. Don't you dare miss it.